Father, thank you for what you're doing around the world, that you're building your church, and we get to be a part of it. It's very humbling, and we're so grateful. We do pray for Carlos and his family as he has stepped out in faith to plant this church in Quito. I pray that you give them favor. I pray for financial provision. I pray that they'd be able to establish relationships of trust and harmony. I pray that you'd help them as they establish relationships of trust, as they seek to evangelize. I pray that the gospel would restore families and homes. I pray that you give them creativity through the arts uh, to promote a redeemed and transformed culture. God, I pray for safety for his family, and I pray that he would know that he has brothers and sisters uh, lifting him up, encouraging him, praying for him. God, I pray that you continue to bless our church planting efforts around the world, and Lord, it's all for your glory, and we're thankful to be here this morning to worship and give you all the praise and honor. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, Travis. There's many things I love about Jesus, but one of the things I love about Jesus is the Bible says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Unlike Saturdays in my life. <laughs> Man, I love the Gators, and week by week they break my heart. Interesting, recently I saw an article, and they interviewed Steve Spurrier, like with Gators, if you're not familiar, he's like royalty. And they asked him, <clears throat> what's wrong with the Gators? And what he said was they can't tackle. It was something so simple, and yet it's so true, right? And he went on to say the most important skill in football is tackling. And if you can't tackle, you can't win. A lot of things in life were simple. Many years ago, when the Soviet Union um, was doing so many terrible things, if you ask a grandmother in Russia, how did these things happen? Do you know what the grandmothers would say? We have forgotten God. Something so simple. Well, how did all of this happen to the Soviet Union? And grandmothers would say, what's happened in our country is we have forgotten God. Do you ever find yourself looking around our country and thinking, what in the world is happening? You know what's happening? It's a nation we have forgotten God. And since the problem is very, is very simple, so is the solution. And, and so this morning, what we're going to focus on is something very simple. The point of today's message is remember Jesus. Remember, if you would like to be a part of the healing of our land, remember Jesus. If you're struggling with sin in your life and you'd like supernatural power to overcome the sin in your own life, remember Jesus. If you're struggling in your marriage and you'd really like help to have a, a, a happily imperfect marriage, listen, remember Jesus. If you'd like more enthusiasm for, for sharing your faith with others, then, then remember Jesus. That's what we're going to learn about today. If you have your Bible, turn with me to 2 Peter 1. If you don't, you can follow on the screens. But, but bring a Bible. We want to help you become a disciple. And, and knowing how to find your way around God's Word is helpful. This year, we've been walking through 1 Peter and now 2 Peter. And our purpose in this is we're trying to equip you to follow Jesus in an increasingly hostile culture. If you're old like me, when, when I was younger, the, my community celebrated my faith. And then a little later, it tolerated it, and now it's hostile. So we're, we're, we're trying to equip you so you would know how to navigate our culture and follow Jesus. And so we walk through 1 Peter. And what 1 Peter said a lot is, don't be surprised when we suffer. Don't be surprised when we suffer for doing what's right. Okay, so we learned about that. And, and now we're in 2 Peter, and the primary message of 2 Peter is, don't be led astray by false teaching. There's false teaching in our culture, isn't that true? And there's false teaching in the church. And so what 2 Peter is trying to do is to equip us so that we're not all led astray by false teaching. So now we pick up, we took a two-week break from 2 Peter, now we're back. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. 
If you're a mom, what do you say to your kids? If I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, right? So notice what Peter is saying here. You know these things. You've, you're established in them, but I want to remind you of them. I consider it right, as long as I'm in this earthly dwelling, to stir you up by way of reminder. I want you to remember Jesus, to remember Jesus. I want to stir you up, not by teaching you something new, but by reminding you of what you already know. Knowing that the laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also our Lord Jesus Christ has made known, has made clear to me, and I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to mind. Peter knows he's about to be martyred. And so in this book, we get a picture of his heart more clearly than anywhere else because these are like his last words and he wants people to remember Jesus. Because notice what he said, that Jesus has made clear to me how I'm going to die. <laughs> remember Jesus, or remember Peter at the end, three times he denied Jesus, remember that? And then after Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus gave Peter three opportunities to affirm his love for him. He asked him, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord. And Jesus said each time, tend my sheep, shepherd my sheep. And so let me pick up that in John chapter 21. This is the third time. In John 21, verse 17, Jesus said to Peter the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. That's what Peter's doing in 2 Peter. He's taking care of God's precious people. He's trying to remind them and remind them of the important things so that after he dies, they'll remember what he taught them. Uh, and then notice what he said, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Peter, one day you're going to be arrested and you're going to be bound and you're going to be martyred. Now, this he said signifying what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. And I love Peter. He looks over and he sees John and says, well, what about him? Remember what Jesus said? He said, what? Don't worry about him, Peter. You follow me. You see, when Peter is writing 2 Peter, Nero was, he was the Caesar in Rome. And, and Nero had, uh, he had set a fire in Rome because he wanted to get rid of the slums in Rome. But what happened is the fire spread much farther than he wanted and burned most of Rome. So he looked for someone he could blame for burning Rome. And guess who he decided to blame? Christians. So he blamed Christians. And Nero would die in 68 AD. So in 65 AD, Peter and Paul, two of the apostles, were both martyred. I never thought about that till this week. You, don't, you know how Paul was martyred? He was beheaded. Do you know why he was beheaded? He was a Roman citizen. And they didn't crucify Roman citizens, so he was beheaded. But, but Peter was a, a non-citizen, and so Peter was crucified, because that's what Rome did to non-citizens in the worst. And tradition says that he was crucified upside down, because he didn't feel worthy to be crucified the way Jesus was. So Peter, it's his last letter. It's his last letter, and he's trying to prepare the church for what is to come. And so he wants to remind them and remind them and remind them, I stir you up by way of reminder. And so today, what we're going to learn is to remember Jesus, to remember Jesus, and then, well, what do we need to remember about Jesus? That's going to, what we're going to do first. What do we need to remember? And then secondly, why is it so important that we remember and then thirdly, uh, uh, how do we remember? So what did Peter want to stir them up by way of reminder? 
Peter, in, in each chapter of this book, lays out one of them. And in chapter 1, in chapter 1, what Peter wants them and us to remember is that Jesus saves us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. What is it important that we remember? That Jesus saves us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Remember when we started the book? In chapter 1, verse 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith, there's the word faith, of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, there's the Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. The gospel we love is that Jesus saves us by his grace alone, through faith alone in Christ alone. Have you been saved? The reason we need a Savior is the gospel that means good news has bad news, and the bad news is we have a problem called sin. Any evidence in the world we have a problem called sin? Any evidence in our country? Any evidence in our lives? Do you know what sin is? It's a crime against God. We push God away and say, God, we will do life our way. And so we commit crime after crime against God. And we're in big trouble. The Bible says that God is just. And that what we deserve for our crimes against God is hell itself. So what do we do? What do we do? The bad news is we've sinned. We're in big trouble. The good news is that Jesus is our Savior. He, he's not our teacher. Our, our Savior. He came to seek and save sinners like me and you. So God the Son put on flesh and came to earth. <clears throat> And he lived a perfect life. He met the entrance requirements for heaven for us. He lived a perfect life. And then he went to the cross and he took our sins upon himself and he died in our place. And he didn't stay dead. He rose. And he offers us the chance to be saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. He offers us the opportunity to be justified by faith. Let me show you that in, in Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, how are we put right with God? How? You guys there? How? What does the Bible say? By what? By faith. Notice it's not by works, it's by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what it means to be justified? It means the moment we put our faith in Jesus, all of our sins, all of our sins are given to Jesus and we're forgiven. How would you like to be forgiven of everything you've ever done or ever will do wrong? That's justified. But listen, that's not all. The moment we believe the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, so from that moment on, our standing before God is not based on our performance, but on His. <laughs> wow. So wait a minute. You're saying, finally, we can exchange our sin for His righteousness. Yes, that's what justification is. He takes our sin, and He gives us His righteousness. Isn't that the best deal ever? You guys there, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Um, so the question is, have you been justified by faith? Have you been saved by faith? Um, well, well, what exactly is faith? Saving faith really is simple. It's as simple as ABC. It starts when we admit, and then we believe, and then we commit. Listen, to be justified, to be saved, we admit, Jesus, I've sinned against you, and, and I'm sorry. It's not just the world that's broken. I am. And we believe, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And then we commit. We trust him as our Savior and Lord. To trust him as Savior is Jesus, come in and forgive me. Give me your righteousness. I have none. Give me eternal life, won't you? And then I want you to be the Lord of my life. And from this day forward, as you give me strength, I will follow you all the days of my life. If you've never done that, won't you do that? Won't you admit and believe and commit even now? Or I'll be glad to give you that chance the, when we close in prayer. And if you have, I want you to hear what it says. Therefore, having been justified by faith, this happened. If you put your faith in him, your sins are gone. He's given you his righteousness. We have peace with God. Our nation's divided, right? Families are all mad at each other. Isn't it great to know that when we put our faith in Jesus, we have peace with God? Isn't it? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Peter is saying. <clears throat> Back in 2 Peter, remember, remember Jesus. Remember Jesus saves us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. 
a bondservant of God and the apostle, to those who have received a faith, remember, remember you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, of the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior. Not only does Jesus take our sin, he gives us his righteousness, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. When your heart is troubled, do you look at Jesus? Do you remember Jesus and ask him to fill your heart with grace and peace? <laughs> um, remember, Jesus saves us by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. Look at verse 10 of the same chapter. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. stumble. Now, now make sure you put your faith in him. Make sure he's chosen you. Make sure he's called you. Make sure you're justified. Because when you're sure, listen, you won't stumble. You won't um, be led astray. So what do we need to remember about Jesus? First of all, that Jesus is our Savior. That we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now, the latter part of chapter 1 and where we're going in the future in chapter 2, what he tells us is, remember, Jesus is the truth. He's not just the way, he's the truth. That Jesus is the truth, and we need to remember that Jesus is the truth, and he's given us his word, and he's given us his spirit so that we would know the truth, so that we would know Jesus, that we would follow Jesus. <laughs> Don't we hear all kind of voices today, don't we? And don't you find yourself sometimes saying, I just wish I knew the truth. And so Peter is saying, Jesus is the truth. We can know the truth. His word is true. His spirit is the spirit of truth. Where we're going next week is uh, <clears throat> Peter is with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember that? Jesus goes up the mountain with three of his disciples and his glory is unveiled. And Peter heard the audible voice of God. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And we say, man, if I could just hear his voice like that, I, I, I would be so changed. And then Peter says, what we'll see next week is Peter says it's better to have the written word than to hear the voice from heaven. You know why? Because voices fade, but we have his word that we can pick up and read day after day after day. And so next week we're going to see in chapter 1 where, where Peter writes, But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture, no word of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of the human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Listen, God breathed into men who wrote down what God intended so that we have the word of God and there is a place in a morally confused culture that we can go and find truth. Oh, I am so thankful to know Jesus. I'm so thankful that we own copies of the word of God because we have the truth. And listen, not only do we have the word which is true, but we've been given the Holy Spirit. We've been given the spirit of truth so that as we read the word of God, the Holy Spirit helps to hear the voice of Jesus and know how to follow him in a very confused culture. Oh, how many of us say, well, if I just could have seen Jesus. But remember what Jesus said, what he said, it's to our advantage, didn't he? He said it's to our advantage that he goes away, right? Jesus said that it's better to have the Spirit inside us than Jesus beside us, didn't he? Do we believe that? Jesus said it's better to live when we live where the Spirit's inside of us than to live when the apostles did when Jesus was beside them. In John 14, Jesus teaches us this. In John 14, verse 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit. Isn't it cool to know that the author of the Bible lives in us and he really likes the word because he inspired people to write in it. And when we read the word, the author illumines his word so that we see Jesus and hear his voice in his word. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. 
Wouldn't we run to church if we believed that? Wouldn't we get up in the, in the morning if we believe the Holy Spirit who inspired Scripture lives in us and He wants to teach us all things, that there's a place we could go to find truth? He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Remember, in a confused culture, Jesus is the truth. He's given us his word. His word is truth. He's given us the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, to guide us in the truth. Oh, no, I love his word. Listen, listen to John 10. In John 10, my sheep hear my voice. Are you a sheep? When you read and hear the scriptures, do you hear the voice of Jesus? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. The Holy Spirit's always saying, look at Jesus. Isn't that the life you want to live? Follow him. He's wiser than you. Follow him. They follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So much false teaching. So much false teaching in our culture. So much false teaching in churches. How can we keep from being led astray? That we remember Jesus. That Jesus is the truth. And he's given us his word, which is the truth. And he's given us the spirit, which is the spirit of truth, to guide us into his word, to bring to our remembrance all that he said, so that as we walk through life, we hear his voice and not the voice of our culture. And we follow Jesus and not the world. So remember, what is it that we need to remember? That Jesus is our Savior. He saves us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. What do we need to remember? That Jesus is the truth. And because he's the truth, he's given us his word, which is truth. He's given us the spirit of truth to guide us into the truth. And then when we get to chapter 3, when we get to chapter 3, Jesus is going to, uh, or Peter is going to teach us to remember that Jesus is coming back. That Jesus is coming back. And... Our mission is really, really urgent. His mission for us is really, really urgent. You see, in a few weeks, we'll get to chapter 3, and we'll get to verse 1, and we'll read, This is now, beloved, the second letter I am writing to you in which I am stirring you, stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder. Do you notice he's not teaching them something new? He's just reminding them. He's stirring them up by way of reminder. I am stirring your way up by way of reminder that you should, what? Remember. Remember? Remember? Remember the words spoken beforehand by the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior spoken to you by your apostles. Remember Jesus? Remember what he said? Know this first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking following after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Coming for ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. He's not coming back. You Christians are such silly people. You're going to be on the wrong side of history. You need to get with it. You need to get with it. No, he's coming. He's coming. Our mission is so important. Oh, where we're headed is verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Jesus delays to give people the opportunity to be saved. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Oh, when you go out today, make sure you look to the left, okay? And you'll see a trailer. It's the trailer for Operation Christmas Child. And here's what's going to happen. Early Tuesday morning, it's going to exit the property. And as soon as it leaves, you know what's going to happen? Car after car is going to come into the parking lot. It's going to happen Tuesday, 
It's going to happen Wednesday. It's going to happen Thursday. It's going to ha- and they're going to have their boxes. But you know what? It's, what? it's too late. The door is closed, and they miss the opportunity. Remember the story of Noah? Remember the story of Noah? God provided a way for people to escape. And uh, for 120 years, they had that opportunity. And only eight people were saved. And then the door was shut, and it was too late to enter in. Jesus has delayed his return for over 2,000 years because perhaps there's someone here today who is yet to put your faith in Christ. Won't you be saved? Because when the door is shut, it'll be too late forever to enter in. Won't you be saved? And, and, And listen, why has he delayed his return? Because those of us who know him, We have people we love, don't we? We want them to be on the inside, not the outside, don't we? So he has delayed his return to give us the opportunity to go to the people we love and invite them to come, come and believe while there is still time. So that's the first question, right? Remember Jesus what? Remember, remember that Jesus saves us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Remember Jesus. He's the truth. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit so that we wouldn't be led astray by false teaching, so that we would hear his voice and follow him. Remember, Jesus is coming back. Our mission is urgent because one day it will be too late for people to be saved. Well, <clears throat> Smiley, why do we need to, be, why do we need to remember <laughs> You know why we need to remember? Because we forget so quickly, don't we? I mean, don't we forget? We have six kids, and I was there when each of them was delivered. And when I watch Karen go through labor, I say, I will never forget this moment. I'm going to be the best husband there's ever been. I'm never going to be unkind to her. I'm going to put her first. I'm going to treat her like a a, a queen forever. How long do you think that lasted? Like five minutes, right? But you know what helps? To get out pictures and remember, right? And remember what she did. And when I remember, wow, it changes my life. We forget so quickly, don't we? You know why we need to remember? Because we lose the wonder of it all so quickly we become familiar. You ever ever wonder how many days it took the Israelites to lose the wonder of manna? Do you? How many days did it take? Two million people. We're fed by a miracle every day. How many days do you think it took? The first day, this is amazing. The second day, I mean, you think of the third or the fourth day, same old thing. Don't we lose the wonder of being forgiven so quickly? Don't we lose the wonder of getting to do life with Jesus so quickly? Don't we? Don't we lose the wonder of, of being saved from hell for heaven? Don't we lose that wonder? We need to be reminded, right? We need to be reminded because we lose the urgency, the urgency of our mission. I think most of us, we have waves. We have waves of 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 a concern for lost people, and they come and then they go. And we need to be stirred up by way of reminder so that we never lose our urgency. You know why we need to be reminded? Because we lose our first love. I mean, you become a Christian, you start leading a small group, you do all these things for Jesus, you do all these things, but you've left your first love. And so the reason we need to remember is because we forget so quickly. We so quickly lose the wonder of all. We lose the urgency. We lose our first love. So that brings us to the last, and that is how? How do we remember Jesus? How do we remember Jesus? Well, in in the study, there is a disciple-making map, and when, when you win someone to faith in Christ, we want to teach you uh, we want you to you to be able to equip people to abide in Christ. The way we remember Jesus is we spend time with him. And the word abide, the best definition is to be with a friend who loves you and stay there. We want to help people when they believe in Jesus to to be with their friend and stay there. And that's how we remember. So there are three parts of remembering that are really worship's important and a small group is important and spending time with Jesus is important. Do you know why worship is so important? Because we spend... Start our week remembering Jesus. 
Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. I understand how God blesses us, but how can we bless him? Here's how. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. Why do we come to remember what we have in Christ? Who pardons all your iniquities? Thank you, Jesus. Who heals all your diseases? Thank you, Jesus. Who redeems your life from the pit? Who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion? Wow, you've saved me from hell. You've, you've given me a purpose. Thank you. Who satisfies your years with good things so that your wealth is renewed like the eagle? The reason we gather and sing to Jesus is to remember. The reason we gather to pray is to remember Jesus. The reason we give, the reason we gather to hear God's word is to remember Jesus. And then the first Sunday of each month, we have a family meal, and Jesus says what? Do this in remembrance of me. I know, I know, sometimes you come and say, you know, Smiley, I've heard that, you know, a thousand times. Well, there's not many things I have to tell you. But I'll do my best when we gather together to remind you to remember Jesus. Therefore, I will always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them and have been established in the truth which is present with you. I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder. I mean, isn't that really why we come to be reminded of what we already know, to be stirred up? And listen, that's why we gather in small groups. It's not so much to learn something new, though sometimes we do, but we do gather to remember. As we gather together, we share what we've been reminded of in Scripture. We open up the Bible together and we remember Jesus together. When we pray, don't we pray that Jesus would be real in each other's lives? Uh, we gather to remember. Oh, and, and that's why we want to spend time with Jesus. We want to spend time with Jesus. I've been a Christian longer than many of you have been alive, and I've read through the Bible more times than you have years. And, and, and I really usually don't learn new things. But, oh, I'm reminded. This week, wasn't it fun to read through Second Peter? It was so good. And, and, and then 1 John. And, and so I was reading in 1 John 2. Many of you were. And, and, and I want to share with you what I read. 1 John 2, 1 and 2, my beloved, my little children. Now, one of the things we're trying to teach you is how to read the Bible and then pray the Bible and then share. So I don't read the Bible and then pray. I read and pray at the same time. Thank you that I'm a child of God. I'm writing these things to you that you may not sin. Jesus, help me not to sin. I don't want to sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Oh, Jesus, so many people are against me. I'm so thankful to have an advocate who's for me. Isn't it great that we have an advocate who's for us? His name is Jesus. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Jesus, thank you for experiencing the wrath of God so I wouldn't have to. Oh, and then a few verses later, I got to verse 15. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. Oh, Lord, I'm way, way too attached to the world. Lord, help me to love you. Help me to love you more than the world. Any of you love the world too much? Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Oh, Lord, help me to love you. Help me to love you more than the world. Help me. And, and then I got to verse 25. This is the promise which he himself made to us, eternal life. Jesus, thank you for eternal life. And that means when I look ahead, you know what I see in the future? I see good, better, and best. That's pretty good, isn't it? My life is good now because I get to do life with Jesus. I'm never alone. It gets better. It gets better when I die because I go to be with him. But the best is for all of eternity. I'll be with Jesus on a new earth forever. Wow, thank you for eternal life. And then I read verse 28. Now little children abide in him. There's the word. <laughs> He's your friend. 
Spend time with him. Abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him and shame at his coming. I know a lot of people, they know Jesus is coming back. They're trying to time it just right. They're trying to time it just right so they can really behave right before he comes. I've got a better strategy. You know what it is? Why don't I do what I want to be doing when Jesus comes back? And then whenever he comes back, he'll find me ready. And you know what I want to be doing? I want to be with a friend who loves me and stay there. Don't you? Oh, man, I had such a good time starting each day with Jesus. It wasn't so much about learning something new as it was I was stirred up by way of reminder. So this week, you're off to a great start. We're starting our week with Jesus. Listen, when we go to small group, remember, get up and remember Jesus. And then throughout the day, when we go through tough times, remember Jesus. Let's remember he's with us. He's in us and for us, and this too will pass. When we have good times, let's remember Jesus. Wow, thank you. It's a beautiful day. Thank you for being good to me. When we face temptation, remember Jesus. He's our model, right? He was tempted. We can learn from him, right? How to handle temptation. When we lose, when we lose that urgency to share the gospel, remember Jesus and we'll want to go and share him with others. Um, Do you know one of the best ways to remember Jesus is to talk to someone else about him? Did you know that? That's why in the study, we're really encouraging you, trying to equip you to read the word and then learn to pray the word and then go and share the word. And whenever you share Jesus with others, you remember him more than that person does. And listen, that works not only in in, in our time with Jesus, it it happens in worship. When we come to worship, we should hear God's word. As we leave, we should be praying God's word. Lord, help me to remember you. And then we should look for opportunities to share what we've learned. And so I believe this week, all of us will have this opportunity. We will be with someone this week, and uh, they'll say, what's happening in our country? And you can say, that's what we talked about in church on Sunday. And then say, could I ask you a question? What do you think's broken in our country? Ask them. Listen. And then ask them, what do you think the solution is? And then if they ask you back, what we learned in church on Sunday was, listen, here's the problem. We have forgotten God. And and what's the solution? To remember Jesus. And then you know what they're going to say. How's that going to help? Oh, here's how. Jesus puts people back together again, one at a time. And when he puts people back together, he puts families back together. And when he puts families back together, he puts churches back together. And when you put churches back together, you put a community back together. And when you put communities back together, you change a nation. Jesus' plan for the healing of our nation starts at the bottom and works up, and he invites us to be a part of it. Don't you want to be? Remember Jesus. You can be a part of the healing of our nation. You can. I believe this week we're going to have conversations with people and they're going to say, man, I have really messed up. And you can say, me too. Know what we learned in church on Sunday. We learn that Jesus saves us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Listen, you can be saved through faith. You can do it. You've been taught. You can do it. I believe this week we're going to have conversations with people who are going to say, I wish I could just know the truth. And you're going to remember Jesus and say, that's just what we talked about on Sunday. What we learn is that Jesus is the truth. His word is true. He's given us the spirit of truth. You really can know the truth. And life is So much better when you know the truth. Oh, what a great assignment we have this week. It's really simple. You know what it is? Remember. Remember Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for coming to seek and save sinners like me, like all of us. Thank you for dying and thank you for rising and offering us salvation. Listen, if, if you've never been saved, won't you take advantage today because one day it'll be too late. Jesus is here. Won't you admit to him? Jesus, I've sinned against you and I'm sorry. 
And won't you believe, won't you tell him, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose. And won't you commit, Jesus, I want you to come in and be my Savior and forgive me. Give me your righteousness. Give me eternal life. I want you to be Lord of my life. Help me be the person you want me to be. Oh, if you've done that for the first time, won't you mark that on your card? We'd love to celebrate with you. Remember, Jesus saves us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And Lord, I pray as your people that today would have stirred us up by way of reminder and that we would leave here rejoicing, rejoicing that you have saved us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And we would leave here rejoicing that you are the truth and you've given us your word and your spirit so that we can know the truth and not be led astray. And Lord, I pray that we would leave rejoicing knowing that you're going to come back one day and make all things known. Lord, I pray we would leave here with a new sense of urgency to share with others what you have taught us today. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.